Anti-Federalist Paper, Section 29, Brutus Letter 9. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by M. L. Cohen, Cleveland, Ohio, May 2007. 17 January 1788. The design of civil government is to protect the rights and promote the happiness of the people. For this end, rulers are invested with powers. But we cannot from hence justly infer that these powers should be unlimited. There are certain rights which mankind possess over which government ought not to have any control, because it is not necessary they should in order to attain the end of its institution. There are certain things which rulers should be absolutely prohibited from doing, because if they should do them, they would work an injury, not a benefit to the people. Upon the same principles of reasoning, if the exercise of a power is found generally or in most cases to operate to the injury of the community, the legislature should be restricted in the exercise of that power, so as to guard as much as possible against the danger. These principles seem to be evident dictates of common sense, and what ought to give sanction to them in the minds of every American, they are the great principles of the late revolution, and those which govern the framers of our state constitutions. Hence we find that all the state constitutions contain either former bills of rights, which set the boundaries or powers of legislature, or have restrictions for the same purpose in the body of the constitutions. Some of our new political doctors, indeed, reject the idea of the necessity or propriety of such restrictions in any elective government, but especially in the general one. But it is evident that the framers of this new system were of a contrary opinion because they have prohibited to general government the exercise of some powers and restricted them in that of others. I shall adduce two instances, which will serve to illustrate my meaning as well as to confirm the truth of the preceding remark. In the ninth section, it is declared, quote, no bill of attainder shall be passed, end quote. This clause takes from the legislature all power to declare a particular person guilty of a crime by law. It is proper the legislature should be deprived of the exercise of this power because it seldom is exercised to the benefit of the community but generally to its injury in the same section it is provided that quote, the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless when in cases of rebellion and invasion the public safety may require it end quote. this clause limits the power of the legislature to deprive a citizen of the right of habeas corpus to particular cases that is those of rebellion and invasion. The reason is plain because in no other cases can this power be exercised for the general good. Let us apply these remarks to the case of standing armies in times of peace. If they generally prove the destruction of the happiness and liberty of the people, the legislator ought not to have power to keep them up, or if they had, this power should be so restricted as to secure the people against the danger arising from the exercise of it. That standing armies are dangerous to liberties of the people was proved in my last number. If it was necessary, the truth of the position might be confirmed by history of almost every nation of the world. A cloud of the most illustrious patriots of every age and country where freedom has been enjoyed might be adduced as witnesses in support of the sentiment. But I presume it would be useless to enter into a labored agreement to prove to the people of America a position which has so long and so generally been received by them as a kind of axiom. Some of the advocates for this new system controvert this sentiment, as they do almost every other that has been maintained by the best writers on free government. Others, though they will not expressly deny that standing armies in time of peace are dangerous, yet join with these in maintaining that it is proper the general government should be vested with the power to do it. I shall now proceed to examine the arguments they adduce in support of their opinions. A writer, in favor of this system, treats this objection as a ridiculous one. He supposes it would be as proper to provide against the introduction of Turkish janzaries or against making the Alcoran a rule of faith. From the positive and dogmatic manner in which this also delivers his opinions and answers objections made to his sentiments, one would conclude that he was some pedantic pedagogue who had been accustomed to deliver his dogmas to pupils, who always placed implicit faith in what he delivered. But why is this provision so ridiculous? Because, says this author, it is unnecessary. But why is it unnecessary? Quote, 
because the principles and habits as well as the powers of the American are directly opposed to standing armies, and there is as little necessity to guard against them by a positive constitutions as to prohibit the establishment of the Mahatman religion, end quote. It is admitted, then, that a standing army in time of peace is an evil. I ask, then, why should this government be authorized to do evil? If the principles and habits of the people of this country are opposed to standing armies in time of peace, if they do not contribute to the public good, but with endanger the public liberty and happiness, why should the government be vested with the power? No reason can be given why rulers should be authorized to do what, if done, would oppose the principles and habits of the people and endanger the public safety. But there is every reason in the world that they should be prohibited from the exercise of such a power. But this author supposes that no danger is to be apprehended from the exercise of this power because, if armies are kept up, it will be by the people themselves, and therefore to provide against it would be as absurd as for a man to, quote, pass a law in his family that no troops should be quartered in his family by his consent, end quote. This reasoning supposes that the general government is to be exercised by the people of America themselves. But such an idea is groundless and absurd. There is surely a distinction between the people and their rulers, even when the latter are representatives of the former. They certainly are not identically the same, and it cannot be disputed, but it may and often does happen, that they do not possess the same sentiments or pursue the same interests. I think I have shown that as this government is constituted, there is little reason to expect that the interests of the people and their rulers will be the same. Besides, if the habits and sentiments of the people of America are to be relied upon, as the sole security against encroachment of their rulers, all restrictions and constitutions are unnecessary. Nothing more is requisite than to declare who shall be authorized to exercise the powers of government, and about this we need not be very careful for the habits and principles of the people will oppose every abuse of power. This I suppose to be the sentiments of this author, as it seems to be of many of the advocates of this new system. An opinion like this is as directly opposed to the principles and habits of the people of America as it is to the sentiments of every writer of reputation on the science of government and repugnant to the principles of reason and common sense. The idea that there is no danger of establishment of a standing army under the new constitution is without foundation. It is a well-known fact that a number of those who had an agency in producing this system, and many of those who it is probable will have a principal share in the administration of the government under it, if it is adopted, are avowedly in favor of standing armies. It is a language common among them. Quote, that no people can be kept in order unless the government have an army to awe them into obedience. It is necessary to support the dignity of government to have a military establishment." End quote. And there will not be wanting a variety of plausible reason to justify the raising one. Drawn from the danger we are in from the Indians on our frontiers or from the European provinces in our neighborhood. If to this we add that an army will afford a decent support and agreeable employment to the young men of many families who are too indolent to follow the occupations that will require care and industry, and too poor to live without doing any business, we can have little reason to doubt but that we shall have a large standing army as soon as this government can find money to pay them, and perhaps sooner. A writer, who is the boast of the advocates of this new constitution, has taken great pains to show that this power was proper and necessary to be vested in the general government. He sets out with calling in question the candor and integrity of those who advance the objection and with insinuating that it is their intention to mislead the people by alarming their passions rather than convince them by arguments addressed to their understandings. The man who reproves another for a fault should be careful that he himself be not guilty of it. How far this writer has manifested a spirit of candor and has pursued fair reasoning on the subject, the impartial public will judge when his arguments pass before them in review. He first attempts to show that this objection is futile and disingenuous because the power to keep up standing armies in time of peace is vested under the present government in the legislature of every state of the Union except two. Now this is so far from being true that it is expressly declared by the present Articles of Confederation that no body of forces, quote, shall be kept up by any state in time of peace except such number only as in the judgment of the United States and Congress assembled shall be deemed requisite to garrison the forts necessary for the defense of such state." End quote. 
Now, was it candid and ingenuous to endeavor to persuade the public that the general government had no other power than your own legislature have on this head, when the truth is your legislature have no authority to raise and keep up any forces? He next tells us that the power given by this Constitution on this head is similar to that which Congress possess under the present Confederation. As little ingenuity is manifested in this representation as in that of the former. I shall not undertake to inquire whether or not Congress are vested with the power to keep up a standing army in time of peace. It has been a subject, warmly debated in Congress more than once since the peace, and one of the most respectable states in the Union were so fully convinced that they had no such power that they expressly instructed their delegates to enter a solemn protest against it on the journals of Congress should they attempt to exercise it. But should it be admitted that they have the power? there is such a striking dissimilarity between the restrictions under which the present Congress can exercise it and that of the proposed government that the comparison will serve rather to show the impropriety of vesting the proposed government with the power than of justifying it. It is acknowledged by this writer that the powers of Congress under the present Confederation amount to little more than that of recommending. If they determine the raised troops, they are obliged to effect it through the authority of the state legislatures. This will, in the first instance, be a most powerful restraint upon them, against ordering troops to be raised. But if they should vote an army contrary to the opinion and wishes of the people, the legislatures of the respective states would not raise them. Besides, the present Congress hold their places at the will and pleasure of the legislatures of the states who send them, and no troops can be raised but by the assent of nine states out of the thirteen. Compare the power proposed to be lodged in the legislature on this head, under this Constitution, with that vested in the present Congress, and every person of the least discernment, whose understanding is not totally blinded by prejudice, will perceive that they bear no analogy to each other. Under the present Confederation, the representatives of nine states out of thirteen must assent to the raising of troops, or they cannot be levied. Under the proposed Constitution, a less number than the representatives of two states in the House of Representatives and the, rep and the representatives of three states and a half in the Senate, with the assent of the President, may raise any number of troops they please. The present Congress are restrained from an undue exercise of this power, from this consideration. They know that the state legislatures, through whose authority it must be carried into effect, would not comply with the requisition for the purpose if it was evidently opposed to the public good. The proposed Constitution authorizes the legislature to carry their determinations into execution without the intervention of any other body between them and the people. The Congress under the present form are amenable to and removable by the legislatures of the respective states and are chosen for one year only. The proposed Constitution does not make the members of the legislature accountable to or removable by the state legislatures at all, and they are chosen, this one house for six, and the other for two years, and cannot be removed until their time of service is expired, let them conduct themselves ever so badly. The public will judge, from the above comparison, how just the claim this writer has to that candor he affects to possess. In the meantime, to convince him and the advocates for this system that I possess some share of candor, I pledge myself to give up all opposition to it on the head of standing armies if the power to raise them be restricted as it is in the present Confederation, and I believe I may safely answer not only for myself, but for all who make the objection, that they will be satisfied with less. Brutus End Anti-Federalist Papers, Section 29